A massive super eruption about 75,000 years ago on the island of Sumatra could match the timing of a dramatic human genetic bottleneck. From a worldwide population in the hundreds of thousands, our entire race may have been sustained by a small band of just a few thousand. But how could a natural disaster in Southeast Asia threaten human development across other continents? The Toba super eruption would have triggered a series of deadly hazards. Close to the volcano, the effects would have been apocalyptic. Imagine pyroclastic flows, superheated avalanches of volcanic material. They wipe out an area of more than 7,000 square miles of Sumatra. They vaporize anyone in their path. They extinguish all signs of life across the width of this vast island. An eruptive column up to 50 miles high ejected more than 200 cubic miles of ash into the atmosphere. We have experienced the lethal consequences of volcanic ash in recent times. When Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted in 1991, the column reached a height of about 22 miles. Dennis Shows was a serviceman stationed at the nearby U.S. Air Base. You could see the volcano erupt because it looked like a, a cloud of ash rolling over the sky. It looks like something out of a movie. Unfortunately, this was a horror show without a happy ending. Everything was just gritty everywhere. All the branches were gone. All the vegetation was just covered and coated and everything was just gone. The Pinatubo eruption killed 320 people. Volcanic ash caused most of the deaths. But here, volcanologists identified the threat early. A mass evacuation saved up to 20,000 lives. At Toba, there would have been no warning system, and the super eruption 75,000 years ago ejected 200 times more volcanic debris than Pinatubo. The ash cloud would have covered an area in excess of a million square miles. Now, a new archaeological find gives unique insight into the impact of this terrible downpour on Stone Age societies. In the year 2000, a layer of Toba ash about four yards deep was identified in southern India by Dr. Michael Petraglia of the Leverhulme Center at the University of Cambridge. It is a spectacular deposit, very thick sequence, with archaeology associated with it. It's a one-of-a-kind find. You're pretty far down. In the immediate aftermath of the eruption, nearly six inches of ash fell on southern India. The first threat to the Stone Age hunter-gatherers would have come from breathing in this fine powder. These particles are like little glass shards. And these glass shards, if they get into your lungs, they can cause all sorts of damage. This deadly dust would have poisoned the drinking water and made fertile fields barren. When carried by the rain from the annual monsoons, the dust built up to four yards deep is found at Petraglia's site. Archaeologists have discovered no human remains under the Toba ash layer. A collection of Stone Age tools is the only surviving evidence of the society that existed here before the super eruption. Well, what's so interesting is that we find these in great abundance below the ash. But once the ash came, it seems that those populations using these stone tools were no longer there. Volcanic debris from the Toba eruption threatened hunter-gatherer societies over more than a million square miles. But long after the ash clouds scattered, Stone Age survivors across the globe faced a second threat. An acid cloud, created by the two billion tons of sulfates blasted out by the supervolcano. 
acid droplets in the stratosphere would have blocked out most of the sunlight, triggering a global six-year volcanic winter. Professor Howard Griffiths of Cambridge University investigates the impact of this sudden climate change on plant life. What our experiments have done have mimicked the effects that we'd expect to see following that volcanic eruption. We have reduced the light intensity, we've reduced the temperature, and we've reduced the water availability for plant growth. Acid from the Tobo eruption cut out up to 90% of available sunlight. But plants use energy from the sun to grow, a process called photosynthesis. Griffiths investigates the impact on his test samples of dropping to the lowest light levels of the volcanic winter. What we've got here is that the leaf has now stopped photosynthesizing altogether, so growth would stop. The low sunlight levels caused by the Toba eruption could completely halt plant growth, and the acid cloud reduced global temperatures by as much as 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Griffiths applied this additional trauma to the experimental plants over a period of two weeks. Here you can see there's some immediate effects with rather yellow gaps indicating a loss of photosynthetic activity. The low temperatures has really reduced the potential of this plant for growth. To make matters worse, the volcanic winter would have triggered a major drop in rainfall in some areas. A microscopic exam of test subjects that suffered all these environmental changes suggests that the combination of reduced sunlight, temperatures, and rainfall would have had a deadly effect on vegetation after the Toba eruption. What our experiments have shown is that the combined stresses that were predicted to have accompanied the Toba eruption will have the effect of basically uh, deforesting and defoliating the entire environment. The super eruption 75,000 years ago caused a terrible volcanic winter that laid vegetation across the planet to waste. This could have decimated most present day populations. But there were survivors, and it's their descendants who went on to make the world we know today. So who were these people, and how might they have survived in the harsh aftermath of the most powerful volcano of the last two million years.